Hi, this is Lisa Ryder, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. Hi, guys. Welcome to the FSF Podcast. I'm Tim. I'm your host. Of course, Kathleen over here is my co-host. Today, our guest is an actor you've seen in movies and TV shows like Jason X, Forever Night, Earth, Final Conflict, and of course, 109 episodes of Andromeda as Becca Valentine. We are very excited and happy to welcome Lisa Ryder to the FSF Podcast. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've, one of the things that we'd like to do, we'll just jump right into the questions here, because uh, we've got a few things we want to get to, and we've got some great questions from an Andromeda uh, fan group uh, for you towards the end of the show, and... But uh, one of the things we love to start off with is uh, because we're nerds, uh, we we fly that flag proudly, and even in many fun co pops. Uh, but uh, we love to know the origin stories, the background of our guests, kind of what makes them tick, what got them to be the person they are on the other side of the virtual table. So, in the story of Lisa Ryder, what influences helped guide you to a career in the arts? You know, I, I uh, grew up as a Mennonite girl in Edmonton, so you wouldn't think I'd get into the performing arts, but um, somehow my mother uh, was a big, we, my parents were divorced when I was young and my mom was a big believer in lessons. So got okay. me into dance lessons, all kinds of lessons. I was in drama lessons and dance lessons and a lot of performing. I was always interested in um, performing. I was also, um, so I danced quite like competitively and stuff in high school and also was a teen model in Edmonton. And at the time I had this boyfriend who was a really talented choreographer. So we had, a, he had a dance company that I was involved in. He would choreograph fashion shows at nightclubs. And the, the idea of performing was always, um, was kind of, it was my way out of, uh, it was my way out of, um, I guess Edmonton, it was a way to uh, express myself, a way to connect with people. I just loved the performing. And I I pursued modeling for um, a couple years as in, in Toronto and Germany and uh, New York. And um, it, it was really not for me. Like the, it's just not for me. Anyway, so I enrolled in university, being completely lost and 19 years old going, I I just need some stability. So I went into university, I got into the theater department and that's where I kind of, I learned more about theater, more about acting, got together with a bunch of people. We formed a company, got into writing and um, performing our own shows. And um, after that's like a hop, skip and a jump to like get your agent and then go for TV. Right. Right. That's how I got into. It. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, other than uh, other than your mother being open minded and being willing to help, you know, kind of get you into all those lessons and, and get you the training that you needed. So I, I often wonder this about people who, you know, they say that their, their, their parents were had such a, a nice driving role into what they were doing. But I also wonder on the opposite side of that, was there a particular actress or actor, uh, a movie, something where you look where something clicked one day and you go, I could do that. That, that might be fun. I have to say, um, n no, I mean, I, I was a big fan of, you know, being of the age that I'm a big fan of footloose, flash dance, all that. And that being dance related, um, lit me up as a, okay. a young person, but no, like I, I really didn't understand the being an actor in my early life until I got into theater. And then it was more like, I am only doing theater and I'm only doing German theater and I'm going to be a purist. And, you know, uh, sure. so it was kind of, um, you know, influences uh, in Toronto theater were um, important to me in terms of, I, I guess, acting and performing. But it's only, you know, as I as I grew up that I I actually understood what acting, you know that uh, the craft of it and the interest okay. in that all right fair enough so you mentioned when you were talking when you were answering tim's question i have actually read it on online as well that not knowing that you were going to go into acting until you were at university in toronto that that was that was when the the acting bug 
sparked when it kicked you. So looking back at, at how you got to where you are, would you go back and give yourself advice now? Like, what would you say to your younger self at 19 in Toronto? It's so interesting because I have a, an 18 year old who's in university right now and completely not getting it, like not getting, why am I here? And I'm like, you know, that's kind of what your late teens, twenties is about is exploring. So I don't think I would tell myself anything different. I think I could have taken a more direct route to where I'm going, but I don't think I would be, I would be a completely different person. Right. I, I think it is just, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. Uh, it is really important to get out there, explore and, um, you know, all the influences that you are soaking up at that time kind of make you the actor you are and um, the person you are and mm -hmm. influence your interests, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually yeah, love I that. I have, a, I have a five-year-old. My daughter's five and she just started ballet this year. And so looking at the, I mean, I was in dance as a kid as well. And so I'm looking at the, okay, so here's what my path was. Well, what's her path going to be like getting to to see it firsthand? I'm like, I wonder, I, I frequently do the, well, what would I go back and tell myself? Like, what do, what do I think she needs to hear that I would have wanted to hear? At the wow, how will I mold my child? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. You just, you, you quickly, well, you, if you haven't learned already, you, you can't, <laughs> they just, don't, they just, you can even try uh, and it, it won't work. They, they are going to, figure it out themselves and pursue their own thing and become yeah. the person that they are. Yeah. I guess my, my biggest thing now is the fostering the person that she is without having it absolutely kill me. She is a very spirited, very, very opinionated little person. And it's the, I know she needs this fire. She needs, she's going to need this spunk. I just need to survive it first. <laughs> Because she's yeah. not at all like her mother, not even a little too, bit. But it'll, it'll be less hard on you later when she's, um, you know, got, got a mind of her own as a teenager. And I was like, no, that doesn't work for me or that, you know, it's going to be good. It is. It is. It's going to be amazing good for you for recognizing that it's, it's, it's really, it's fun it's, to see. Yeah. It's and I'm fun having a hoot watching it from the sidelines. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's funny as there were, there's, there've been a couple of, a couple of people in our, in our life who have done the, well, you know, that if you, if you want her to be more submissive, this is the age that you have to start ingraining that into her head. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, she's, Whoa. I'm not going to, we no. don't really need submissive women. I, I don't think. No, we Why? Don't. <laughs> no, no, we just don't. Have a sense of humor about it. I think. Yeah. No, it was, the, I'm like, yeah, my husband told me that one of his, one of his friends had done the, you know, she's still young enough. You can, you can change that attitude. And I'm like, mm, no, Negatory good buddy. I don't think yeah. I could if I tried even with her. <laughs> Why? Why do you want to take a perfectly good kid and then crush it? No. <laughs> it's a difference when you're talking about maybe uh, negative or, or destructive habits versus personality traits that are just who she is and what she is. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, because I also have a, I have three children and my youngest is my daughter and she's also very spirited uh, and she's, not at all like me. And um, <laughs> that's a lie. Uh, he's my mini me. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting because the only things that I've ever tried to rein in with her are the, the personality traits of myself where I was like, you know, when I look back at her age and go, okay, well, this is some of the areas that led me to getting into a little bit of trouble. So let's just, you know, and not even trying to clamp them down on her, right? Just trying to help her to see the the path of where this can go because I want my children, I want each of my children to be independent thinkers and, and be able to have that critical reasoning and an ability to look ahead and see, okay, here's the issue. Here's how I move past it uh, without mom and dad standing there going, Oh no, no, you can't do that because mom and dad aren't always going to be there. They are going to have to be critical thinkers on their own. Mm -hmm. it's difficult to, yeah, just let them play it out. Isn't it? Oh, it's uh, tough. I have a difficult time with that. I, I think I've done my share of helicoptering. Um, but in terms of the spiritedness, I mean, I think it's the challenges to like channel it. How do you, mm -hmm. channel it? how do you not warn and shock and um, discipline, but how do you like, 
that's great what you have. Um, where can it go? Like, is that right? Does it go into martial arts? Does it go into clubs? Does it go into like what? What is their passion so that you can help it's their them? drive? Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Use their force for good. Exactly, exactly. So, like, like I actually I've used that almost that exact sentence with my daughter when talking about uh, stubbornness, because I'm like, you know, I'm a very stubborn person, a little bit, kind of. And uh, I just told her, I'm like, that could be a force for good or for evil. It depends on how you use it. If you're stubborn because you're, uh, you know, you're trying to do the right things and you refuse to do the wrong things, then stubbornness is fantastic. But yeah. it can also lead you down the primrose path if you're not careful because you're stubborn uh, and do the dumb things. Right. So right. it's all in how you guide it, how you direct it. But they got to figure out some of that for themselves. Yeah. At least that's my opinion. As much as we know that it's going to hurt. Exactly. It's not always comfortable to watch, but you gotta, you gotta let them, you gotta let them stub their toes every now and then. So they know where the boundaries are, you know? Yeah. That's a tough one. It is. It's a tough All one. right. Just we'll nothing like kid getting hurt. And it's just like, uh, uh, <laughs> do anything to not. No, absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when it's the, I told you, you were going to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not above that. I told you so. Oh yeah. No, I've done that. I've done that plenty of times with my daughter with the, I'm pretty sure I told you that wasn't a good idea. I know. <laughs> okay. As long as you understand. All right, love. We're all on the same page. Let's move. We can move forward now. Uh, well, let's segue from actual family to another type of family. So we've had an opportunity to speak with a few of your uh, former Andromeda castmates. Mm -hmm. uh, we've spoken with Laura Bertram. We've had a chance to sit down with Gordon Wolvet and, of course, uh, Lexa Doig. And uh, they all talked about how they enjoyed the onset family atmosphere with, with between the actors and and how you guys all got along and and um, and how they had hopes that the storyline would be able to continue uh, past the end of the fifth season. So in your opinion, what needed to be done in order to keep Andromeda going past the fifth season? Right, right. Here's what I would say that we took the last season, cut, delete and start <laughs> before that time. Um, I, I wasn't thrilled with how how it was going. By, by the time we got to the, the planet of Sifra, um, I had a sense that, I had a sense that um, there wasn't an overarching um, plan. Mm -hmm. I had a sense that it was a little bit like, like I was, I was having a hard time uh, keeping up with it. So in order to continue it, and I think that show had so much promise. Uh, when I first auditioned for it and read the Bible that um, Robert had written, I was quite jazzed. And um, I think we all were. Um, so many worlds and established, um, established planets, established orders, kind of arcs that were, you know, going to unfold. Um, when Robert left, um, that idea, those ideas kind of, uh, were abandoned a little bit. And, um, I would have loved to see how that world would have played out. Um, okay. there were plenty of interesting, fun, um, things that were explored like after he left, but, but I, I, I really liked his cohesive vision and I, I think it would have, it would have done well for the show. Uh, and another thing that's been thrown out there in some fan groups and, and on some discussion boards is the possibility uh, of, you know, people always look back and they go, what show could be with deserving of a reboot of a, you know, of a, re a fresh start. And a lot of people f actually feel that Andromeda is one of those shows that there is so much potential left on the table with this show that there's opportunity for that to happen. Have you ever given that consideration of, of that? You thought that maybe that's a show that could somehow I, be rebooted, re, re, you know, you know, brought back to life. After we finished the show, I was like, you know, as with any long running show, you're just like, Oh, you think that's I'm done. I'm done. Um, and I felt like that for quite a while, but yeah, like, because it's been so long now, mm -hmm. I have, I was like, what would it be like to go back? Um, I, I think that that is a fun idea, super fun idea. And like um, the other actors that you've talked to before, a lot of it, because it was a great time in my life, a great vibe on set, 
really good uh, friends, good relationships. Uh, the crew was fantastic. So, you know, yeah, to revisit that would be uh, fantastic. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I'd like to see from, from my own personal uh, viewpoint. Now, I look at a lot of shows that were filmed in that era, you know, because of where technology was at that point. Yeah, what could be done on set now What's with technology? I mean, I there know. are so many things that Andromeda was trying to accomplish that I think that they they got it to like you know it needed to be here and it was like you know just there was it was just so close but they were at their limits of their technology. It was not because of anything that they were doing that was bad. But it was I think a, that and it still is a time of uh, incredible growth in terms yeah. of that in terms of yeah. special effects and yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm and so, so it curious. was outdated, right? Like, it, yeah, we, we were, you know, from the first to the fifth season, lots of changes and lots of mm-hmm. growth. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, because it's like watching. Uh, if you go back and watch, you know, original Star Trek now, I and mean, everything's, you know, it seems kind of silly and campy. But then you watch like Strange New Worlds, and it's all modern tech and you know CGI and graphics and all these different things. And I'm, and I look at and- Andromeda in kind of the same same vein and like it's still very good it still holds up it's it's a great show but I, in the back of my mind i when i'm watching some of the scenes i'm like oh, i wonder what that would be like with modern you know modern capabilities modern technology cgi uh, yeah. proper, you know some things properly done um yeah, i think it'd be really cool but yeah i mean like you said though there i mean there i don't know i've gone back and watched a few and i i, I now it, it, with so much time going by, I, I, I appreciate the camp of it, you know, like, Oh yeah. Camp is great. Do you, you know, I think even in the first episode or the well, first season for sure, um, the bub- <laughs> bubble, the bubble helmets, the pig aliens, the wolf aliens. I mean, at the time we were all going, uh, <laughs> like, this isn't as edgy as I thought, but like actually looking back on it now, it's, I find it quite delightful. Oh yeah. It's a great watch. It really is. It's, um, and like you said, you, there, there, there's a little bit of camp to it, but then again, I love campy movies. Like I'm a big fan of the movie flash Gordon, um, you know, from the, the late seventies, early eighties, that's, right. that's about as campy as can be, but it's still a fun watch that, you know, having some camp to something doesn't, doesn't yeah. take away from the enjoyment. Matter of fact, at a certain point, I think it kind of adds enjoyment in, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's highly part of the fun of Andromeda at this point for me is when we go back and watch it, is that you have to keep in mind it's it, the era in which it was recorded and it was filmed. And you also go, yeah, it was, it was such a good show and was so much fun then. It's still fun now. And then it allows your, it allows your brain to kind of wonder, do the, the what ifs and the wonderings and you know, what could be done. I do the same thing with Flash Gordon when I watch it. I was like, you know, oh man, if they were to re- reboot this and recast this, who would be great? And I'll think about all the great CGI and what they could do with this, you know, this world and that. And yeah, so. Yeah, for sure. You know, sure. with the, with the Magog and, and Andromeda still be, you know, made oh, out of yak yes. fur and, oh, <laughs> and smelly. Yeah. In his yak fur suit and that, yeah, they would have, yeah, in this day and age, they would have saved him a lot of of sweat (laughs) (laughs) such a great actor right and and it's just like just he he started to kind of wither and melt (laughs) every episode yeah yeah Yeah, nowadays it would be an ikea rug not ex suit (laughs) 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 and now a word from our show sponsor level up savers Their link can be found in the show notes. like Tim mentioned we got to we've gotten to speak to some of your former co-stars and looking at your previous work and at Lex's previous work you guys were both in Jason X 
And in Jason X, you play the AI bot and Lex is the human. But then in Andromeda, you guys have a bit of a role swap where you're the human and Lex is the AI bot. Did you guys ever discuss the irony of those situations of you guys kind of role swapping? (laughs) Yeah. And in fact, I think there were costume pieces that were um, consistent between one show and the other two. And we're like, this is crazy. Like I have the same boots as I, you know? Um, Yeah. We thought that was, that was kind of crazy. It was a crazy time. I, there was actually overlap between Jason X and Andromeda. And I think I went out to Vancouver to do Andromeda first before Alexa, or had a few days, mm-hmm. came back and reported to her. And I'm like, this is what it's like on set. And this is what you can expect. And then, you know, like, I think we were uh, going back and forth a little bit. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. Was, was one of the roles easier for you to play? Was it easier to be the human or to be the AI or? Well, I just adored being an AI. Like I just did, it was so much fun for me. And like I say, this is a little bit my, you know, my background of, um, performer. Mm-hmm. Um, I like dress up. I like those, uh, I like those kind of choices, like those big kind of, you know, like being an Android, honest to God, uh, the dress up of it, the bad wig, the fake <laughs> just um the action of it like Mm -hmm. all that action sequence i just adored it but at the beginning was more fun than becca because at the beginning i didn't know what to make of becca and i was just trying to figure it out whereas with an ai go oh that's what it is i totally get i get what's happening here um with becca there was a certain amount of um just trying to figure it out you know during the first season. Um, But, you know, as I settled in, as I was given storylines for Becca, Mm -hmm. those were super, I always, and and, you know, again, with the flash, like I I love the white contacts. I love being addicted to that drug. I liked the heightened state. Um, That's kind of my my jam. Yeah. And I think a lot of people miss how much in like, especially the first season of a show, how not only watching it are we getting to know the characters, but the actors are getting to know the characters too. And there's usually such a a change from the way that a, a character is portrayed in the first season to the way that they're portrayed in, in later seasons. And I think that's a lot of the times that shorter run TV shows actually get robbed of that character build. And when you see it in a longer run TV show, you're like, oh, that's the full character. That makes more sense. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then Absolutely. you go back and watch the first season again. You're like, oh, wait a minute. Where where the rest of them go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fun, I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree. In that first season, I think we were all kind of, you know, in a, yeah, there, it's all written for you in the Bible and stuff. But like when you're fleshing things out, you know, I was told, you know, Becca's a hard ass and she's, she's a pirate and she's Hannah Solo. And, and that, always wasn't always reflected in the scripts I was given. Mm. So uh, there's a lot of conversations with Robert's like, what do you mean by, you know what I mean? And sometimes you realize, right, they're trying to, they're creating cut, they're working with archetypes at mm-hmm. the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then they flesh it out when they see what you're doing, you're altering what you're doing. Like it's, it's, it is collaborative. Yeah. In, in a sense, you know, at some point I remember them saying like a, the, the intention was always for Dylan and Becca to have this tension. Um, and I think, I don't know, halfway through the first, and they would do things like, you know, take my clothes off, and have me coming out of the shower and bumping into Dylan, like trying to stage these, this chemistry. And at some point, one of the executives was like, you know, you guys, it's, that's not going to happen. I'm like, yeah. And then it became uh, just because of the chemistry that I naturally had with Keith Cobb, um, so like, let's, Hey, I see this happening on set. Like, so then they pursued that storyline. It's, it, it, it's, they're watching what we're doing. We're trying to, mm-hmm. you know, paying attention to the clues that they're giving us, but it's not a play. It's not written in stone. And then you get mine, the clues, and then it's there for you. It is ongoing and it is a conversation. I love that. Well, that's mm-hmm. cool too. It's neat. So two things about that. Number one, I love the fact that you called uh, Becca Anna solo, and that actually makes a whole lot of sense in my brain. Um, 
<laughs> it really actually does. Uh, not to mention, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and Han Solo is my favorite character of all time. So as soon as you said that, it was like it was like light bulb went off. I was like, oh, wait a minute, I I get that reference. That totally makes <laughs> sense. Awesome. Okay, we can go with this. Um, but I, the other thing I like about what you just said is I like the fact that the the, the writers for the show were paying enough attention that they did not force uh, something because as you know, as an audience member we can tell when when something's getting you know pigeonholed in and there's well that that character relationship really doesn't work but here we go we're doing it anyway robin you know so <clears throat> yes, a... robin and ted in how i met your mother yes oh. that's a very <laughs> that's a i mean that was, of the beauty of, that was the beauty of robert hewitt wolf uh being in vancouver on the set uh always like he was there um yeah, it was, it was, um, and I guess they, I guess uh, that's the thing about a showrunner, right? It's just like, it's really hands on. It is, they're, they're in there paying attention mm-hmm. right. to what's, what's working and what's not working. And, um, and of course he's getting it from all ends. He's getting it from producers. We want it more this way. And, and the actors are like, what does this mean? Like he, that, that showrunner is the person who has to, you know, pay attention to everything and make that all work in their vision of the show. So. Yeah. Very cool. All right, Lisa. So we've got some questions for you. Not that we don't have already had questions for you, but uh, we're part of an Andromeda uh, fan group. And uh, a lot of the people in that group are excited to know that we were talking with you today. And uh, so we gave them a chance to ask you some questions. We're like, hey, you want to ask Lisa some questions? They're like, heck, yeah, we do. And they sent them on in. So we've got a handful of questions here that we selected for you uh, from those those fine folks. Uh, So here goes. And the first name I'm going to uh, totally obliterate. And Linda, I just want you to know I am so very sorry, but I'm going to give this uh, the old college try. Uh, Linda. Higa Higa Ashiyami, and I am so sorry. Higa Yashiyami. Let's go with that. Uh, you can correct me later. I'm uh, available through Facebook. You can tell me how bad I did. So uh, with last name like Basigo Linda, I, I understand slaughtering of names. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> so Linda wants to know: Was there a story arc that you would have liked to have had for your character Becca Valentine, but it didn't make it into the show? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, uh, sure, lots of them. I I liked pursuing the flash uh, angle. I liked I I always wanted to pursue. This is such an actor thing to say, but I always wanted to pursue Becca's backstory. Um, okay. Whenever I got a backstory show, I was like, yay, more me, more things to do, and more and more fuel for my um, going forward journey. There's one one little story that was kind of touched on when trance uh, became new trance. There was uh, Becca showed up from the alternative reality and um, who had red hair and the she was a bit of a cyborg at that point. And that was like, a, I think, 10 seconds on screen. And I really would have loved to pursue that um, alternate reality line. Um, anything like that, I, I I love, I would love. That would be fun. Okay, very good. Or of the alternate reality, that would be. I love alternate realities. I, I would have liked to spend more time in that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, definitely. Yeah. So Thomas Bivens asked, what was your first thought when you entered the Maru set? Was there anything that you wanted to add to it? I, I was totally, I, I loved the Maru set uh, much more than the Andromeda set because just the way uh, the both sets are, um, when you walked into the Maru set, you were walking into an actual ship. Like it was, it had sides, a back, a front, like it was just very immersive, right? Whereas the Andromeda set was, um, it's like the, the the nose was all, it was, it was like a stage more. Um, so just for the actors, it, it just felt like I was really in a ship and I loved it. I loved that it was uh, rusted and um, clunky and I loved the bunk beds. I, um, what do I don't want to add to it? I mean, it was pretty great. 
they had a kitchen. We had, yeah, I'm, uh, no, I, I, I love that set a lot. That's cool. I would, I never would have thought about the difference between the way the sets were set up like that. That's cool that the, yeah, it's well, because the Andromeda was so large, right? Like this whole, like the whole front part was missing. That was just uh, the studio. And then we were mostly like, it was kind of like a proscenium almost <laughs> like a stage. Um, whereas the Maru, yes, you'd get the whole crew in the Maru with you, like in their corner with the, you know, the camera, the mic there, it's all crowded. And it was, um, sometimes they take the nose cone off and then, you know. All right. Uh, let's see. Chris, Chris Pate asks, what was it like meeting John Delancey? Did he have any Star Trek behind the scenes stories for you guys? I do not remember any, st you know, uh, I guess I was a, I was a fan and it's, I was a little intimidated by him because I was a fan mm -hmm. of him and I, I didn't want to be like this raving. Can you tell me, you know, I, I just, I felt a bit, I don't know. I, I really loved his work. I loved working with him. I don't think I asked for stories and I don't think he held forth with stories either. He was, you know, working on scenes with me. And so, um, I don't, I'm sorry to say it. it's probably a disappointing answer, but I, I don't think I got stories, but working with him was a joy. He is so good and such a pro and, um, great uncle Sid. That's fair. I think these guys understand that this, you know, we're, we're trying to tap into memories from, you know, a couple of years <laughs> back. So. Recesses of my, yeah. As, as I always tell people, I'm like, I don't remember what I had lunch for yesterday. I've slept since then. So, uh, you know, we're asking you to go back years. So, yeah. I feel like I would be in the same boat, though, with John Delancey that I would just be like, I, I would be such. Hi. <laughs> right. Hi. <laughs> I don't know how to word anymore. You want to come do a scene with me? <laughs> And plus I had to, I had to be, um, kind of strong enough to stand up to him, challenge him, rebel against mm -hmm. him. And I, mm -hmm. I frankly was like, you know, yeah, intimidated. <laughs> so I was that's trying fair. to a cool front, I think. I, get that. I think that's a fair response, especially when you're talking about being a fan of somebody's, you know, we've had people on the show who I'm a big fan of, and it takes everything just to like, I'm. I'm okay. I can do this. I I'm will be professional. I am <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> I am person. Ask questions. You like, right? exactly. Yes. Oh gosh, we have we have the opportunity coming up to talk to Jonathan Frakes, and I, that's going to be me. I'm going to be like, nope. oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <be> nope. <laughs> a blubbery mess, and I can't wait. Totally forgotten um, everything. Over to Tim, because yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to be sitting here like, <laughs> oh boy. I giggle. He asks, go do things. <laughs> yep. Man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. So Jennifer Marie Reynolds also wanted to ask, what outfit was your favorite to wear? Well, I did like my leather jumpsuit, um, especially when they distressed it. Um, we had, um, oh, for heaven's sake, so this is my memory. Our, our costume designer, Tony took all my wardrobe from the first season and just tore it up <laughs> and added mesh, um, distressed it. And so that black jumpsuit, which was pretty cool. It was made for me. I like, I was a comfortable in it. It was pleather. It was a weight loss uh, <laughs> strategy. I can't believe like how much pleather. Anyway, uh, she, I think she cut off the sleeves. She, she made it a little bit less black, a little bit more grunge. Um, I like that one with belts quite butch i liked it a lot all right you did have some pretty Very cool costumes i really yeah. Yeah. i'm like i'm looking at the the google pictures and i'm like oh man i forgot how cool some of your outfits were i know really cool um badass pants hannah solo pants mm -hmm. pants with pockets and low slung and um yeah she was a crazy um creative mind tony she had great ideas all right, one last question from the group, and this comes from Danny Rimmer. Danny wants to know, why is she so awesome? Let's see. Why is she so awesome? Is Becca awesome? 
or is Lisa? I think he means, I th- I think he means Lisa, but we can go with both. <laughs> well, that's very sweet. Very sweet to hear. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that's an impossible question to answer. She just is. She just is. <laughs> But why is Becca so awesome? I mean, Becca, what, I thought Becca was awesome because Becca was like a, um, a rebel, uh, like an orphaned rebel from a tough, tough circumstance and a survivor. And I, I, I dug that about her. A little bit of a criminal, a little bit of a heart of gold. I, I, I thought she was awesome. Hannah Solo. I will never see <laughs> her as Hannah Solo anymore. <laughs> My brain literally went, Susie said that. So. <laughs> uh, so Lisa, we we like to end our show with a silly question because some of our other questions are obviously so serious that we feel that we need to, we need to just throw an extra silly one out there at the end. And this was actually a question I had come up with a while ago, again, because I have a five-year-old. And it's one of those things that as an adult, nobody asks you, nobody seems to care anymore. And I think that that's awful. So Lisa... What is your favorite dinosaur? I have to go for like T-Rex. I mean, because of cuteness, because of like the little, little, because of this, arms. just because of this. They're little, yeah. They're probably little probably a little little answer. Answer. You probably wish I would have said something obscure, but really this is so cute. So cute. <laughs> it is. It is. And it's so funny is I, I've always been a fan of the T-Rex as well. And then especially like watching Jurassic Park and they seem so scary in Jurassic Park. And then as they've done more research on, on dinosaurs and realizing the more and more that they're built like birds. Yeah. That it's more likely that a T-Rex wasn't roaring at you, but honking at you like a goose. Yeah. And I'm like, it's the little arms and the goose honk. Just... And that's cute as well. <laughs> Tim's I like, mean... oh, but speaking of that, like, isn't are the Velociraptors completely not what they're portrayed to be as no, well? Aren't not. they? Yeah, like, Velociraptors are like turkey sized. Yeah, they're about the size, yeah. a, a third of the size of the mind of the that we see them. Yeah. So the ones that they portray, they're more like the Dionychus is the way that they're they're shown. But Dionychus is not as much fun to say no, no, as no, Velociraptor. We will have to look that up later. I only know that one because Dionychus is my husband's favorite. And okay. they're the ones that are the the bigger raptor size, but also a friend of our a friend of the show's has a beautiful rant about velociraptors and the fact that they they get too much credit for being turkey sized and then they get basketball teams named after them and it's like yep that's right <laughs> yep but again I mean the was it Ben Franklin that wanted the the U.S. bird to be the turkey? So I guess yeah, it only makes true? sense. Yeah, the It'll noble make... turkey, the noble yeah, the noble turkey that will literally drown in the rain. I know the noble have... delicious turkey. <laughs> I have a friend who periodically will send me. Uh, she she's so crazy. She's from the country and she's obsessed with wild turkeys. So every time and I. I think she's ridiculous because she will always videotape her hunting for the wild turkeys. So now she hunts for wild turkeys, not hunts them, but she, she's always in pursuit of them. She'll videotape wild turkeys in the wild and send them to me for my benefit, because I think she is completely it's, and it's mostly just my friend, just the sound of crunch, crunch, crunch. I think I see, I think in the distance, if you can just peer through the tree, that's a lot of that and very few wild turkey actual I sightings. Love so that funny. so yeah. much. It's ridiculous. I love that. I'll let me so try a Steve Irwin voice and see if I see if it comes <laughs> right. out any better. Turkey, there's a turkey over there. See, you know? my, my, <laughs> only, my only real complaint about wild turkeys is how dumb they are. Like, they're yeah. so they they are the the epitome of bird brain. Like I was I was driving home from my mom's house and my mom just jokingly had done the watch out for turkeys and I'm like oh yeah sure whatever. Twenty minutes from my mom's house, I hit a freaking turkey because it was walking around the side on, along the side of the road. I moved over to give it space that apparently startled it more and it flew into my van. Yeah, well that's on him. 
It was. It was. That's not on you, Kathleen. So then I called That's my mom the with the seriously? Seriously? <laughs> You had to say, I told you to look out for turkeys. I mean, that's on them for not evolving properly. So, <laughs> right. when, when the bird, like I said, when the bird is so dumb that they will literally drown in the rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. special creatures. You know what you could do, uh, Lisa, is uh, you could repay her by taking a bottle of wild turkey and putting that out in the woods. And then you could be like, I'm hunting wild turkey and then have it show up. And then you could be like, but there's a, there's a, there's an alternate uh, style of Turkey. This one's the wilder, wilder Turkey. And could it be like a, a wild Turkey, American honey. Uh, and then have that one, the honey flavored one. And you'd be like, you know, I'm finding all the turkeys did it. You know, be very, very quiet. I'm drinking wild. Turkey. <laughs> I'm drinking wild Toki. I'm doing exactly. it. <laughs> oh, oh goodness. Oh Lisa, we have enjoyed our conversation so much with you today. Where can our where can our viewers and our listeners go to find out more about you and your work? Gosh, I gosh, I don't I don't know. I'm I'm out there. Um the the most recent thing I've done is a TV show called From, which is available on Paramount Plus. Um Paramount Plus. Yeah. Um, I do not have a website, but you know, I'm on IMDb and uh, I'm around. Awesome. Well, I will mm-hmm. tell them what we have told them in the past. When in doubt, Google her. You'll Google is free. Google. Yeah, there's some frightfully old stuff in there, but like tell them to check out From. It is a great, sh- it's a really great show. It's filming now. Um, I'm only in a few episodes, but um, pretty cool. It is on my watch list on Paramount. Pardon me? It's on my watch list on Paramount currently. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It recommends. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will definitely, we're just going to, in the, usually we'll like link your website or your socials. We're just going to put in there, Google is free. And we'll, we'll put in Google a link for, for the Yeah. I, I have to say like the Instagram, I mean, I do, I am on Instagram, but uh, I don't trust Instagram anymore. I have had so many people try to friend me who have no posts. They don't follow anyone. No one follows them. And suddenly they want, so I'm becoming very suspicious. I'm getting That's less. happening all the time right now on, on Instagram. Right? It's, not, it's not just I for you. Say on Facebook, the number of men who are befriending me now who are widows, uh, I'm like from, from, from Turkey or speaking of Turkey from Turkey <laughs> or the, the Middle East. I'm just like, that's, that's a weird coincidence, right? Like, yeah, that, it's a, it's it's kind of it's it's going and going across the board for for men and women both. Um, yeah, I've been talking I with some friends who are who are on on Twitter or whatever you decide to call it these days, but um, you know they're having the same problem. But you know they're men and they're getting followed and friended by uh, you know these eighteen to twenty something year old girls. But, you know, it's not because they want to be friends. It's, you know, it's other reasons. And um, yeah, it's and so it's just, it's, it's all very it's odd. Bots or it's like, it's just less and less uh, of a, a fun f- forum now. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Social media is becoming less social and more scammy. So it's true. It's getting it's weird. True. It's getting yeah. weird. Yeah. So. All right, guys. Hey, we want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help our show to continue to grow and get awesome guests like Lisa Ryder right there to come on our show, have some fun, and then share some laughs with us. So please subscribe. It does more than we can ever really describe. And uh, be sure to check out Lisa's work as well. We'll have a link down below to uh, a Google search that you can use for her. If you uh, are unable to type out Lisa Ryder, there'll be one there for you. Uh, but you guys can check her out on the Googs and go check out her new show on Paramount Plus called From. Uh, you guys will enjoy that very well. But also you can go out and watch Andromeda out on different uh, on different streaming services and enjoy that as well. So go check that out. Andromeda is uh, still a lot of fun to watch. And uh, yeah, so have fun, be safe, and uh, make sure to click that subscribe button. And on that note, goodbye. Bye. Lovely to meet you. Copyright 2024 FSF Podcast. 
reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Podcast. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com.